Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Bob Mendelson, and this is the Bob's Your Uncle podcast. Today we speak with George Toma, a National Football League Hall of Famer, a man who owns a Super Bowl ring who's never thrown or caught or run a football ever. He's a groundskeeper. He started in humble beginnings in Northeast Pennsylvania. I was privileged to sit in his home in Kansas City. You can't imagine the great stories this man has to tell us. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining me for this. Bob's Your Uncle, Season 1, Episode 13. Of note, the opinions are strictly my own and those of any of my guests. You can now find us and comment directly to us wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Apple iTunes, Pandora, the list goes on. We have a lot of topics to discuss. Even so, on the Bob's Your Uncle podcast, you are part of the show. We do want to see and hear you. Send us a message on Facebook or video one to us on Instagram. In the weeks to come, we'll have part two of this great story about Major League Baseball and National Football League. We'll talk about country music, Jewish DNA tests, and so much more. Let's see where the spirit takes us. Whether you're at home, online, on the road, with me in your headset at the gym, or out for your evening constitutional, wherever you get your podcasts, that's where we will be. Thanks for being with us these 18 minutes. Historical Marker of the Week On this date in history, the 24th of May, in 1941, Robert Zimmerman, a.k.a. Bob Dylan, was born in Minnesota. And also on this date, in 1819, Queen Victoria was born, a lot further east, over in the UK. Also in 1930, Amy Johnson flew solo from the UK all the way to Australia. The English aviatrix was the first woman to achieve this feat. Her 18,000-kilometer flight aboard a de Havilland Gypsy Moth aircraft took her from Croydon in the UK to Darwin, Australia in 19 days. And that's the historical marker of the week. Amanda, you've mentioned travel for good and using travel to inspire change. What exactly does that mean? Well, I think the first thing we need to look at is what travel for good and inspiring change actually means is it can mean different things to different people. And what I'm referring to personally is using travel as a tool that actually benefits the planet and makes the world a better place. I think we hear the word sustainability thrown thrown around a bit as a buzzword nowadays, and most people tend to think immediately of the environment, but it's actually quite a multifaceted concept. For me, I prefer to think of sustainability through the triple bottom line approach, which is a balance between people, planet, and profit. And without balance between all three, I don't think something can be considered sustainable. So with that knowledge, How do we travel sustainably and make the world a better place? And is this something anyone can do? Yes, absolutely. Anyone and everyone can do this and make choices that benefit the planet while traveling. It does often take a bit more research and having a travel advisor with similar values can assist you with this. One of my favorite tour companies of all time is G Adventures. I've loved them for years and traveled with them multiple times around the world. And I think they really exemplify how travel can be used to facilitate change and they embody the triple bottom line. So examples of this would be with G Adventures, they have their Planetera Foundation, which advocates using their nonprofit organization to change lives through community tourism and seeks to empower and support local communities while engaging them in the tourism process, which benefits both the communities and the travelers while focusing on environmental sustainability. They also have what's called the ripple score, which provides a figure on how much of the money stays within the local community and economy that their tours visit, with many of these tours achieving a ripple score of 100, meaning the money you pay for your tours stays with the local guides, accommodation, transportation, and the restaurants you use, as opposed to going to big Western-style chain hotels or transportation operators, and I think this is a really amazing concept. 
Would you say G Adventures is the norm or the exception? At this stage, I would say they are the exception, but we are certainly seeing progress being made across the industry, and we can chat a bit more about that next week. Excellent. Thanks, Amanda. Have a great day. You too, Bob. Thanks so much. Bye. Sit back and enjoy this interview with George Toma from the U.S., who tells us about lawn care and sports and his own life. George Toma, you are a legend in groundskeeping. You're a legend in your own family. You're a grandfather. You're a father. You're a husband. You're a, a good man. You're from Ukraine. Some of your your history is Ukrainian. Right. I uh, <clears throat> was born and raised in a little coal mining town in Edwardsville, Pennsylvania, in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania around Wilkes-Barre. Everybody in that area at that time was poor. When you were eight years old, you already worked in the mines. Uh, worked in the mines, and m many of them were killed from not a rock fall, but mostly by mules getting kicked because they were the ones that led the mules out of the mines with the coal cars. So uh, my father worked in the mines, and when he uh, when I was ten years old, he died from anthracylicosis. Black so lung that's disease. That's a common problem right in there. West Virginia right, and right, Pennsylvania. Right. So here you are. Well, your mother had how many children to raise? They just had me, my sister, and my mother. So that's not bad, just having two kids. Right. So I got a job on a vegetable farm picking tomatoes and cucumbers. That was 10 cents an hour, 10 hours a day, six days a week. Then when I was 11 years old, I got a job on a chicken farm and the, for 50 cents a day and lunch. But the farmer was a, really a tremendous man. He taught me a lot of things that I still use today in my work. Did he look after you almost like an uncle or a right. pseudo father? Everybody did back there. And uh, every Saturday he would say is kill two chickens and take all the eggs and vegetable you can carry. Then when I was 12 years old, I got a job with a, our neighbor across the street who was a groundskeeper for the Wilkes-Barre Barons, which was a Cleveland Indian Farm Club, Class A Eastern League. Year, uh, Bill Veck was the owner. Uh, he bought the Cleveland Indians. And when he bought the Cleveland Indians, he also bought Wilkes-Barre and like Dayton, Ohio, Oklahoma City, San All the farm Diego. Teams. In those days, you had maybe 20 farm clubs all the way from the majors all the way down to Class D. Okay. And uh, so just like here in Kansas City, in those days, Topeka had a, a, a club. St. Joe had a club in oh. those days. So when I was 16 years old, Bill Beck made me the head groundkeeper. And then that was in 46. And then uh, in 48, the war was over. So uh, I would go in the winter time with Emil Bosner in my book, who's the greatest groundkeeper that ever lived, the groundkeeper for the Cleveland Indians. We would go into deactivated uh, naval stations, army bases, and we would build some fields, and then they would use the barracks, the officer barracks for housing and dining. And uh, uh, so the first one I remember was in Driver, Virginia, or our naval, uh, deactivated naval air station right by Norfolk. And then the next year I went down to an Air Force base in Georgia. And then in, 19, in uh, 1950, we went to Daytona Beach where there was a naval air station there mm -hmm. deactivated. And we built six fields and they were named after famous Cleveland Indians ball players, and uh, and today that's where the Daytona 500 is on that, that same land, ground same where the ground six fields the, were. Right, the Bob Feller Field, etc. Right, that's where it was at that time. So then, in December of 1950, I was drafted into the army. So. I eventually went to Korea and fought in the Korean War, mm. and then I came back in uh, 1953, 
And then uh, in 53, I came back and Wilkes-Barre didn't have a team. They moved it to Reading, Pennsylvania, about 90 miles from Wilkes-Barre. And uh, Hank Greenberg says, we're going to send you to Reading, Pennsylvania. I says, I'm not going. And they says, how come you're not going? You don't want to go? I said, the groundkeeper there is my friend. He has two children, and I'm not going to take his job. I'm just out they of the wanted, army. Hank Green, what role did Hank Greenberg have? He was like in a farm season. He was an instructor. So he'd already played. He was already done with yeah, baseball. Yeah, he was I mean, done, right. With uh, his, his own major league career. Right, right. Not many Jewish guys play in the major leagues. In 53, I worked for Detroit. And in 54, I worked for Detroit. Then in 55, they asked me to be the head groundkeeper of Buffalo, New York, in the AAA International League. So, so you keep going up right, the ladder so, of right. I went up minor there. leagues, and AAA is as high as you can get before right. you're at the majors. For Kansas City spot, because Kansas City became a major league. Philadelphia team. moved right. to Kansas well, City in 55. Right, so you have a major league team. So he says, go up the press box and call up Park Carroll, the general manager. So before I called him, I talked to my mentor, Raymond Bowser, and he says, George, I told him I was going to Kansas City. He says, don't go to Kansas City. What was his uh, reluctance? He says, it's a bad operation, and uh, it feels bad. And uh, At the old municipal in the, stadium. Uh, in the springtime, it'll flood you out. In the summertime, it'll bake you out. <laughs> so he says, I, I'm in there maybe once a month trying to straighten the field out for my friend Lou Boudreaux who was the manager of Kansas City, yeah. the first manager. So uh, so I decided to come out here on September the Labor Day of, uh, of 1957. And I said, George, you better go to Kansas City because if you screw it up, it's so bad nobody would ever <laughs> notice it. So. And, uh, and the field was all... A lot of rocks, a lot of weeds. In fact, the infielders would cut the crow foot and the crabgrass out of the infield before <laughs> batting practice sometimes. So the field was almost all weeds in April, May. So I had a spray of weeds, and there was more weeds than grass. So when I got done spraying the next couple of days, the field was brown because from killing the weeds and the sports riders and the casters were all over me. Send that guy back to Charleston, West Virginia. Uh -oh. He's known what he's doing. But by 4th of July, we had an oasis in the desert and being the best uh, field in the majors. In one half a, in just a couple months. Right. How, could, I had a, how did that make you feel? Well, it was good because I, a lot of people uh, say helped me. That that time there was a gentleman uh, Dr. James R. Watson, he was an agronomist for uh, Toro out of Minnesota, the lawnmower people, and he helped me and he taught me a, a method of pre-germination of grass seed. We pre-germined, I'd get it grown. Then in 1960, Charles O. Finley bought the... Charlie O. Everybody Char remembers right, him. Charlie O. bought the, the club and everybody hated him, but he was the best uh, owner I ever worked for. What made him the best? I think uh, he uh, would sit behind that chair in the office and then he would come down, talk to you, things like that. And he gave you permission to do what you needed. Right. He and gave you the funds to do what you needed. He, he was he was good and uh, the first thing he did, he. I was getting $250 a month at that time. Money was different, mm -hmm. and he doubled my salary to $500 a month. It was a minor league operation. And I remember then, growing up in the 50s right. and here in Kansas City, and the complaint among all my parents' friends was, Kansas City A's, they're just a farm team for the New York Yankees. Right, right. <laughs> That's what they would say, you know, and 
but you became the head groundskeeper for the Kansas City A's uh, for Municipal Stadium right. from 58 on? Okay, and so the 58 playing year. Right, the, then I was at the Municipal Stadium until 1968 was the last year. When the, the A's left? Right. Were the players really segregated from the grounds crew, crew, from the head office, from the concession people? Or was it like they show in the movies sometimes where the third baseman would hang out with the head groundskeeper, would hang out with the well, Coca-Cola salesman? No, in those days, a lot of times those players were older. and uh, But uh, uh, they were still great people. And uh, Did you have a favorite player in the 60s with the A's? Well, uh, Jerry Lumpy was the second the baseman. The second base, sure. Right, and then uh, he was great to me, and most all the players were great. A lot of the visiting players were outstanding. And then if it wasn't for Charlie O'Finley and those black uh, kids from uh, Lincoln and Central High School and Dr. Watson and Jim Steig, uh, the head of the Super Bowls for uh, the NFL, uh, there'd be no George Toma. They're the ones that made me. We'll have much more from George next week in the concluding part two of this great interview. Every week we read from the number one bestseller of nonfiction ever, the Bible. Today we read from the book of Leviticus. It says this in chapter 23. When you reap the harvest of your land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleaning of your harvest. You're to leave those for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Do you have a comment or question? Do you agree with us? Do you disagree? Well, hit us up on Bob Mendo at AOL.com or on Twitter or Instagram. Bob's your uncle PC. Well, we'll read your views next week. Don't forget to post a review on Apple iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening, and share our podcast with your mates, your friends, everyone, will you? Thanks for helping us get known out there. Also, please follow the podcast, and that way your app will remind you when we're posting a new episode. Don't forget to book all your travel needs with Amanda McGinnis at travelpartners.com.au. Next week, we finish the two-part interview with George Toma as he speaks about the NFL and Super Bowls, where he's overseen the grounds crew on every one of the 56 games so far. What a delightful man. Until then, from me, Bob Mendelson, when things seem bleak or uncertain, look up to God. He's in his heaven. And Bob's your uncle. Shalom from Sydney. Sydney.